Realm presents Outliers, a Realm original. Episode 4. Lodges had not been built on the flanks of the mountains just for skiers. Hot springs attracted visitors too. Warm water gurgled out between crevices and slate gray boulders and formed pools. Steam rose and curled off the water's surface, like it did in a hot bath. In the winter, when I was small, Don and I would bathe together in one of the hot springs we found along our route. The dogs jumped in, too. We'd sit back on a rock ledge and watch the stars, hoping to see a meteor plunging into the atmosphere, warm in our own naked skin. When I was off on my own, I still stripped and waded into hot springs pools for the sheer sensation of warm water contrasting with the ambient frigid air. She was cold, she said, even sitting by the fire. Her lips had grown darker, like the swollen skin of a plum, purplish. A shudder racked her thin body. Her teeth chattered. I wondered how much of her metabolism was still in allegiance to ectotherms. I also wondered if she was faking it, if her growing lethargy was a ruse. But I risked untying her, and when she couldn't stand on her own, I lifted her into my arms. As light as a feather, I thought again. She was limp, almost lifeless. Not far away, I could see the steam from one of the hot springs rising through a copse of trees. I carried her, hugging her to the warmth of my chest, breaking into a run the last few yards. I lay her down on a boulder near the bubbling pool. Here, I said. You can warm yourself in the water. She didn't move. She lay on her back, mouth slightly ajar, lips even more bruised looking and purple, her palms facing upward her fingers curling lifelessly. We only had the clothes we were wearing. I couldn't let them get wet. I stripped down to my underwear first, my exposed skin turning immediately to goose flesh in the frigid cold, for I hurriedly stripped off her clothing. She had breasts, small lavender breasts that I could cup in my hands if I dared. Her torso wasn't boxy, but gathered at the waist, her buttocks swelling and sloping to the top of her thighs. She wasn't sexless, I could see that she was female from a glance. A huge lump formed in my throat. I carried her in my arms into the water, skin against skin, making sure her mouth and nose were above the surface while the rest of her was submerged, cradled in the warmth. I felt something hit me so hard that I nearly moaned aloud. An emotion. Not the physiological response to a naked female I might have expected. Protectiveness. An overwhelming desire to keep her safe. To shield her from harm. She was in a vulnerable state, and I was her protector. I fleetingly wondered if this is what Da had felt when he picked up the helpless, swaddled infant at the side of the road so many years ago. That another's life mattered as much as one's own, even in outliers. She stirred in my arms. She opened her eyes and looked up at me, and she wiggled and freed herself, swimming away. But she didn't climb out of the pool. She stayed submerged, warming herself, with just her head above the water, the opposite side. I stayed where I was, another bobbing head. She glanced at our pile of clothes on the boulder. She didn't thank me, but she didn't condemn me either. We stared at each other for a long time. It was she who crossed the pool, sinuously moving through the water, long hair floating behind her like a mermaid. I was leaning against a smooth boulder, legs bent at the knees to keep the water level with my chin. She stood upright on the same ledge. The top of her head came to the tip of my nose, no further. She studied me closely with her alien eyes before she reached out and started touching my face, running her fingers over my eyelids, through my hair, across the tops of my ears. I didn't dare move. I could barely breathe. You are so strange, she murmured. The ever-expanding swelling in my throat prevented my reply. She laid her head against my chest, pressing the length of her body against mine, encircling my waist with her thin arms. I wrapped my arms around her, crisscrossing her slender back, the knobby vertebrae under her warm skin along her spine rubbing against my forearms. Vertebrae. A million. Endothermic. Almost human. What's your name? I whispered into her silken hair. It was a long time before she replied. Girl, she finally said. Of course, I thought. Of course. We lay naked in the shallow water of the hot springs for hours, wrapped in each other's arms exploring each other's body with probing gentle fingers. Her tongue was soft in my mouth. She tasted sweet, like fresh fruit. 
When she guided me inside her, I was astonished at her warmth and the soft roiling of her damp insides. Desire, joy, hope. Things I'd only read about in books. Towards dawn, we fell asleep in each other's arms, wrapped in a heavy blanket, as close to the campfire as we dared. In the morning, when the sun came up, she was still there, fully dressed, my bowie knife in her hand. She was using it to slice strips of jerky to cook for breakfast on a flat rock. When I sat up, she smiled at me, and I felt my heart swell in my chest until I thought it would either burst or crack my ribs like dry tinder. We will always be together, I knew then. Always. We will live together forever behind the gates of the compound. The simple image of us reading books after our chores were done, cradled in our mesh hammocks on the cabin's porch throughout the lazy days of summer, brought tears to my eyes. I just had to tell Da. I had to make him understand. She accepted that I needed to talk to him first, to pave the way, to cushion the shock. After all, it had only been the two of us for so many years. Go, she said. I'll wait for you. I won't leave. I'll be right here. I kissed her smooth forehead and breathed in the clean scent of her hair before I started running, heading south. At first, because I was so eager, I ran at full speed and nearly caught my lungs on fire. Or at least that's what it felt like. I forced myself to settle into my long-distance, cross-country pace so I could travel steadily. I left her my pack so she would have food, tinder and kindling if she needed it. It was a six-hour hike each way, but the path was too arduous and risky to travel by night. I would return by midday the next day, and then we could go back home, together. I never worried for a moment that she wouldn't be there when I returned. Instead, I worried about Da, about what he would say. The dogs greeted me at the gate, tails wagging like crazy, yodeling the way they do when they're ecstatic to see me. They were hungry, I could tell. Da must not have fed them yet. I unlocked the gate and locked it behind me. The dogs swirled around my legs as I trudged through the fresh blanket of snow to the cabin. No smoke curled out of the cabin chimney. Without a fire in the hearth, it would be freezing inside. Had Da gone looking for me? Da! I called. No answer. I figured he must be out of the compound. Not searching for me, I hope. I fed the dogs in the portico of one of the Quonset huts before I made my way to the cabin. I figured I'd tend to the rest of the animals later. I'd set out several days worth of feed for them before I left, so I knew they weren't starving. I banged through the front door. Da wasn't gone. He was sitting in his recliner near the hearth, wrapped in an old Navajo blanket, his breath coming out in puffs of fog. The room was freezing. There was plenty of firewood. I could see split logs from the doorway. I kept the bin filled to the brim in the winter. His stillness unsettled me. Why didn't you keep the fire going? He said nothing as I piled firewood in the grate and lit the kindling. The logs caught fire quickly, crackling and snapping the way dry wood does. The warmth hit me like a wave and the skin on my face tingled and grew tight. Are you feeling poorly? No response. He watched me as I heated goat's milk in a saucepan on the stove. I hit it with a slug of brandy from a bottle we'd found in an old ranger's cabin. Medicinal, he'd once called it. A remedy for cold bones. Drink this, I said, holding the cup to his lips. He drank short, slurpy sips. His eyes locked onto mine. Cold blue, I thought. Like pictures I'd seen of frigid oceans in the north. Funny. I never really noticed the color of his eyes before. Where have you been, boy? His voice croaked. From lack of use or from sitting in the cold or both? Peak. A word I'd read in the dictionary but had never experienced. His voice was tight with condemnation. I can smell it on you, he sneered. I was confused. Smell what? Girl. His hand snaked out from under the blanket faster than I could have imagined. He struck me across the face with his open palm, hard. The calluses felt sharp, like burrs. I reeled back on my heels, the brandy-laced milk spilling on the floor as I dropped the tin cup. Bewildered, I gingerly touched my burning cheek. He'd never struck me before. Not once. What did he do that for, Da? I heard the plaintive child in my voice and it made me furious with myself. I may not be taller, but I was stronger. All muscle compared to his diminishing bony frame. I straightened up and glared at him. I pulled the footstool closer. Nearer to the warmth of the fire, but not so close that he could strike me again. 
I didn't speak again until my fury had subsided, until I was calm. I don't have to account for every moment of my time. Not to you. Not to anyone. Not anymore. You a man now? The sneer was still there. Maybe so. He straightened up, stiffening his spine, readying a retort. But the fight went out of him like a switch had been flicked and he sank back, breathing raggedly out of his open mouth. He'd always kept his gray long hair pulled back into a stringy ponytail at the nape of his neck like a mountain man, but today I'd suddenly noticed his hair was greasy, unwashed. I could smell it. His usually trimmed white beard had grown ragged, and yellow streaks of dried spittle descended from the corners of his mouth to his chin. I pitied him then. Let me make you breakfast, Doc. I got up without waiting for a reply, or the absence of one, and I made us both a full breakfast. Bacon rashes from canned meat we'd taken from the hunting lodge. Thick toast from homemade bread, sopping with hot bacon grease, and sunny-side-up eggs from the chickens we kept in the compound. We ate by the fire. Mugs of hot cocoa and glasses of fresh spring water on our folding trays. He didn't ask me anything, which surprised me. I waited until he was finished eating before I started talking. I didn't tell him of the hybrid girl, but instead asked him about something I needed to know. Almost anxiously so. It's time you told me the origin story of the outliers. You said one day. It's one day. What does it matter? It matters. He turned away dismissively, but I waited him out. You won't like it. The sneer was back. I still want to hear it. He was right. I didn't like it. It made me sick. So sick that I vomited my breakfast off the porch. I'd always feared I would learn that the outliers came from another planet. That they were aliens. Invaders. Some invasive species from another galaxy that had supplanted human life on Earth. That these alien invaders were the reason for the change. That the before had ended because of them. That humans had almost completely ceased to exist because of their occupation of our fragile planet. That the enemy of my species had recently become the only love of my life. The truth was much worse. You're listening to Outliers, narrated by Rory Culkin. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Outliers is executive produced by Dave Beasley and narrated by Rory Culkin. Created by Cassandra Wells and Dave Beasley. Based on the novella Outliers by Cassandra Wells. Produced for Realm by Alexis Latshaw and Haley Wagreich. Additional sound design and editing by Rory O'Shea. Cover art by Kendall Thomas and Michał Krasnopolski. Krasnopolski.